Amen. God, that's what we do. That's, that, that's our heart's desire. That we stand in awe of you and we surrender everything that we have. And we look at you and we say, all we have is yours. Out of reverence, out of obedience, out of honor, out of respect, we give everything that we have to you. Please use us. We love you, Lord. Amen. Malachi chapter 2. And now you priest this warning for you. And all the church said, oh, it's a sermon about the priest. That means it's not going to come into my life. And I can relax. He's not going to convict me to do anything. This, this passage, and now you priest, Malachi chapter 2, it sounds like this is one of those, those passages that you should preach at, you know, like a preacher convention. A bunch of preachers together that are part of the, the ministry, the, the priesthood. And, you, and you know, they, they would be the ones who would be convicted by this, but you know, we're, ch we're church people. We're not, we're not a ministry, we're not on staff, we're not priests, we're not ministers. We don't have to, we don't have to pay attention. Whew. We can relax. But listen, church, we are all called to the priesthood, to the royal priesthood. If we, Malachi chapter 2, I heard you looking it up in your Bible, and that is good. That's very good. Put a bolt in here, go over to 1 Peter. Go over to 1 Peter. All the way at the end, Hebrews, James, 1 and 2 Peter, 1 and 3 John, Jude, Revelation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. We looked at these last week when we were studying the book of Malachi as the, the people brought lame sacrifices. They brought their leftover. Ah, hey, you know, is, is this good enough to worship God with? And they didn't give their all. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. For you know that it is not with perishable things, such as silver and gold, that you were redeemed through the empty way of life handed down through your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish. We are redeemed through the blood of Christ, the perfect sacrifice. And that's why God expected his people to bring perfect, the best that they had, and offer it to him. Because those reminded them that one day, God would give the best that he had to be the sacrifice to redeem us. And so since we enjoy that, I, I'm very appreciative of what Jesus did. I turn over to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Uh, as you come to him, as we come to Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, we believers, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to the God through Jesus Christ. We are being made into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Each and every one of us that calls Jesus Christ as Lord are being built into a spiritual uh, house to be a holy priesthood. We are all called to ministry. And it says here, bringing sacrifices, spiritual sacrifices. And you're thinking, wait, okay, so God wants us to go Old Testament and I'll become priests and start doing the whole animal sacrifice thing? No, no, we talked about this last week. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. We are to offer ourselves each and every day, to offer the sacrifice of ourselves in service to God because of what he did and to honor him. And so we are called to the priesthood. We are called to ministry, each and every one of us in here. He repeats it again in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Skip, over, skip down to verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We received mercy. We did not get what we deserved the punishment for our sins. Instead, we got grace, forgiveness from Jesus Christ. And so we are now called to ministry, the royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are called to this so that we can do what the priest did. Think about what the priest did. If we go back Old Testament, the priest in Malachi's day. If you're in your Bibles, go back there, Malachi chapter two. The priests were to bring sacrifices. We're called to bring sacrifices. The priests were intermediators between God and people. Well, now we no longer need someone to intermediate for us. We can go directly to God, directly, directly to his throne room. But we still serve 
as intermediators to bring along others and bring them back into a right relationship with God so that they can be in that conversation with God, so that they can have their sins removed through the power of Jesus Christ and they can talk to him. So we all, all of us, all of us are called to the ministry. So this, this passage of scripture, Malachi's uh, warning from God to the priest of the day of Malachi is still relevant to each and every one of us, to our lives today. So you don't get a pass, church. Every time we open God's word, we need to read it and say, how is this relevant? How does this apply to my life? And what can I learn from this passage of scripture? Malachi chapter two, verse one. And now you priest, this warning is for you. If you do not listen, and if you do not resolve to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse on you, and I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have already cursed them because you have not resolved to honor me. Maybe your verse, your translation, instead of saying resolve to honor, says set your heart to honor me. Set your heart. Desire this. Desire that something changes. Resolve to honor me. Set your, your New Year's resolution to honor God. To say, you know what? I want to honor him with my life, with my obedience, with everything I do. But God says it's, it's too late, you priest. You've been messing around and, and offering fake sacrifices for so long. It's too late. You guys need to pay attention. Because listen what God says. The Lord Almighty says, I will send a curse on you and I will curse your blessings. Now think about that for a second. You come to worship. You're, you're in Malachi's day. You come to worship and you bring your sacrifice and you give your sacrifice and the, the, the priests speak for God and they in turn give you a blessing from God. God will curse the priest's blessings. This is someone you don't want praying for you. That's not a good place to be. It's bad in the, in the Bible as we read through the Bible. There are times when God leaves people in their sin. He says, that, that's the way you want to live your life? Okay, well, I will leave you in, the, in your sin. There are times where God is silent. That, that's bad. But here, God is using their blessings to curse them. That's really bad. This is, this, this is a very corrupt priesthood. And God is punishing them. This is a horrible place to be. But why is God so mad? Why is he so upset? Seems like the God of the Old Testament was really mad. The God of the New Testament is really happy. Is that, I mean, is, that, is that really what it is? Is that big of a change? But I don't think so. I think God's upset because they're, they're making a mockery of worship. I think God's upset because they're okay with sin. And that is not acceptable. We become so complacent and so used to sin that eh, it doesn't make a difference. We can, we can live our lives like this because everybody else is living our lives like this. But God sets the clear definition of truth and expects we, his people, to follow it. He's not okay with sin. Chapter two, verse three. So God gives a warning. Verse three. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices and you will be carried off with it. Now we have to stop right here because this is one of those verses that you read and you go, what just happened? This is one of those verses you don't read as a middle school youth pastor because they'll be like, <laughs> you said dung. Okay, I don't, I don't want to get into potty humor. What's going on here? Because God just said something and outside of the context, this seems really weird. And if you look at different translations, if you look at the King James Version, the NIV that I have here, uh, the, the, N, the New Revised Standard Version, they all use the word dung. A literal translation uses the word dung. The NIV, the 1984 version, uses the word awful, O-F-F-A-L, uh, the internal organs of an animal or the refuge, the waste material. It's... It's dung. It's, it's what they would do. They would offer the sacrifices and they would take the dung, the internal organs, the, the waste, and they would take the leftovers and they would take it outside of the camp and they would burn it and they would leave it outside the camp because it's useless. It's junk. It's not needed. And God says, your, your fake sacrifices, your fake worship is useless. And if you continue in it, I'm going to take the waste from your fake offerings, I'm going to smear it on your face, and I'm going to carry you out with the trash. You have no place to be in here. That's God's response to sin. 
See, and, and, and we think about that, and, and there's more to it than just, okay, so you're going to get dirty and thrown out. They'll be unclean. For a priest, for a Jewish priest, you don't want to be unclean. The ritual purifications to, to get you back up to, to par, this is not a good place to be. This is not a good place to be disqualified because of your uncleanliness, to be disgraced, rejected, and removed from worship because of sin. Because a holy God cannot be in the presence of sin. And so some, as I was studying this, say, was this figuratively or is this literally? I mean, is God really going to do this? But the college press commentary, I appreciated this. It leaves little doubt as to how much God despises those who make a sham of his service and how he banishes them from his presence. Take yourself with the trash and throw yourself out. That's how God reacts to sin. Sin is a, is a curse. It's a sickness. It's corrupting these priests and God is dealing with it. Because of you, verse three, I will rebuke your descendants. I will smear on your faces the dung from your festival sacrifices and you will be carried off with it. And you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace. I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. Now, real quick, let's remember what's going on here. Levi. Levi is from, we're going back, back, back. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, his name gets turned to Israel. Jacob has 12 sons. One of his sons is named Levi. And Levi's responsibility is the priesthood. First, he starts by taking care of the tabernacle, and then as it goes on down farther, he starts taking care of the temple. The tribe of Levi, that's their responsibility to take care of the temple, to be the priest, to be God's, God's uh, ministers. That's their responsibility. That's also their blessing. When they go into the promised land, the 12 tribes of, of Jacob, the 11 tribes get land. Levi doesn't get any land. He gets the inheritance from the worship. So when the people bring worship to the, to the temple, their offerings, that's what the Levites get. And it's a cycle. And as the people sink further in sin, they bring less and less and sicker and worse offerings. And the Levites suffer because there's nothing for them to live on. And so they have to start farming. They gotta pick up a second job. They gotta work more to provide for themselves. And so they neglect the temple. They neglect God and they start working. And then it's this cycle that continues to drive the nation into sin. Levi did a good job. There are four things that we see that Levi did well. We're gonna look at those because they're very appropriate for us as ministers today to this nation that God has called us to, to apply in our lives as well. But this covenant that God gives to him, uh, verse five, my covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace. I gave them to him. This called for, and it explains what it calls for. We'll look at those four in a second here. But it's a covenant of life and peace. Simple. You do this, and I'll give you this. Cause and effect. God speaks to the people very plainly, very clearly. If you obey me, you will receive life and peace. If you disobey me, it's going to be bad. Now, this is not always the case today. There are righteous people that suffer. It's not always the case then. There are righteous people that suffered then. But most typically, I have found that when we follow God, when we follow the way that he has designed his rules, his instructions, life goes so much better. The blessings flow. It's not going to protect us completely. We're not invincible. But I believe that he looks down at each one of us that follow him and serve him faithfully and he blesses us. And he blesses us, maybe not in ways that we think. You know, seven uh, extra bedrooms, like lots of, thousand, I don't even know how big a house is. I live in such a small house. But mansions and fancy cars. Let me rephrase that. We live in a house that God provided for us. And it's a perfect house. It's great. It holds us. It's warm. It works. And it's much bigger than the rest of the world. So I'm sorry. Because God's blessed me. God's blessed each and every one of us. 
And I'm not the first one to say, I'm the most perfect, you should bless me most. I'm not. I'm a sinner. Saved by grace. And yet God still provides and blesses me. So I still see that covenant of obey me and life will go well. Not because it's this, this carrot that he's dangling in front of our life, in front of us that we have to chase after, but because God knows how much sin is going to hurt your life and destroy the relationships that you have. I see that in my own life. I see that in the lives of others. I see that in the lives. Kelly comes home and tells me about the kids that she works with at school. It breaks your heart because you see how sin comes into the family and destroys marriage and it affects the kids. It ruins everything. The cause and effect of God's covenant. Try it. I, 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 I challenge you. Try living a, a righteous life and see if it doesn't pay off. I think you'll find it's a good investment. Continuing to read here. Verse seven. From the lips of a priest, for the lips of a priest, ought to preserve knowledge because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty. And people seek instruction from his mouth. But you have turned from the way and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people because you have not followed my ways but have shown partiality in matters of the law. Partiality in the matters of the law. They're biased. They're showing favoritism. Well, I like this person better than that person because they give better sacrifices. So let's not, let's not yell at them. Let's have double standards in church. You can do this, but you can't. We'll invite you, but you can't come in. The priests are corrupt. Things aren't going well. And God is cursing them. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people. It's their fault because of their blatant, unrepentant sin. But God's making it even worse. I think he's doing it to catch their attention to snap them out, to drop them on the rocks all the way down so that they can come back, so that they rebound from the sin that they're living in. And so we look at this and we say, okay, so, so these priests, they're not doing a good job. Levi, uh, uh, Levi's, he's in his grave. He's probably turning over in his grave. He's really upset. He's thinking, look, you're my descendants. Come on, guys, pick up the ball. Malachi's upset because they're not following what God wants them to do. And there's a call to us. There's four things that Levi is quoted as doing well here, and we're gonna apply those to our life because I believe that they do. As we look through all scripture, they they apply very well. Verse four, chapter two, verse four. And you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi will continue, says the Lord Almighty. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace. I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and revered me and stood in awe of my name. We're called to revere God and stand in awe of him. We talked a lot about this last week when we talked about honoring God and respecting God and knowing, knowing my role in the universe as a created being who serves our Heavenly Father. I, I really appreciate that is uh, one of my favorite uh, songs to sing, The Stand. And I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. And I'll stand, my my soul, Lord, to you surrender. All I have is yours. That's a living sacrifice. All I have is God's. A living sacrifice that gives everything that I have to the Lord. In awe of the one who gave it all. Now, now remember, the people of Malachi's day are called to stand in, 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 in reverent fear, in awe of God, creator, giver, blesser of their life, God the ones who had yet to receive the Messiah. We have the bonus. We have the same thing that God gave them and Jesus in awe of the one who gave it all. We got Jesus. He gave everything he had. And so I stand and I appreciate. I stand and I scratch my head because I don't think I could have done it. I know I couldn't have done it. I stand and I look at the sacrifice that God gave for me. And I'm in awe. And because of that, 
I live, I live obediently. Look, if I don't respect you, I'm not going to listen to you. Sorry. It's this kind of middle school here. Like, you can't come up on this hill. Yes, I can, because I'll push you off the hill, and I'll be in charge of the hill. Because it's, it's just kind of a game, you know? Yeah, I cross the line. I'll cross the line. I'll do whatever I want to do. And it, it's defiant of me. I apologize. That was a joke. It is. But when we look at God, do we command him with that same attitude? I'll do what I want. I'm going to stand away from you when you talk like that. Because when I look at my heavenly father, I have to stand in awe in reverence of his name. Levi was faithful to that. The priests at this time were not. They disregarded God's name. Ah, God, whatever, who cares? We don't have to listen to him. It doesn't scare me. I don't owe him anything. I give him everything because I know who he is and what he's done. The second thing that they're called to do, uh, I gave them uh, to him. This called for reverence and he revered me and stood in awe of my name. Verse six, true instruction was in his mouth and nothing false was found on his lips. True instructions. They told the people what to do. That's what they were supposed to do. That was their job. They were the priests. They were the ambassadors for Christ. Verse seven. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he's the messenger of the Lord Almighty. The people should seek instruction from his mouth. When we speak Christians, we speak as ambassadors for Christ. Amen? And so when we speak, we speak true instruction. Not just to our children, but to everyone. The best life possible can be found only in here. When we apply the truth found in scripture to our lives. When we apply the true instruction, which implies, instructions imply that there is a true, correct way and that there is a false, wrong way. And there are many on the false way that have created their own instructions. And it's leading, it's leading to hell. But God calls us, God calls the priest to speak up and to give the truth. I wonder, we talked about the partiality and they're showing favoritism. It doesn't make sense in my mind. I'm reading this and I'm thinking, okay, so you're a priest and, and you don't uh, inherit a land. You inherit what the people bring to the temple as their sacrifices. So, so if someone comes and brings a sacrifice of, of a drink offering or whatever it is, you receive a part of that, a tithe. If they bring a tithe, you receive a part of that. I would think that as a priest, I would want to set the bar pretty high because I'd like some good stuff. Makes sense. Why are they allowing lame and blemished things to come in? But that's what they do. Why, why didn't they speak the truth and say, God is not going to allow that. God is not going to be excited about that. I'm not going to be okay with that because God's not going to be, not just on selfish terms, but more importantly on God's terms. Why did they speak the truth? To these people, why did they give them clear instructions that that's going to be a violation of the covenant? And if you do that, God is not going to bless us with peace in life. You can't go there. But I wonder if after time and time and generation and generation, the truth eroded. And they got themselves into the predicament that they were in. So they didn't speak the truth. They didn't speak the difference between true and false. They didn't do that. They weren't God's ambassadors. They didn't speak truthfully the words that God had called them to. And we see this and we look at this and we see the true instruction found in God's word and we shy away from it because we don't be crazy, religious, fanatic, old school, conservative. I don't know. I don't want to conservative, liberal. I'm not even going to go political. The truth, the way the truth and the life and when we speak the truth, we, that's Jesus. We speak Jesus. Jesus said it. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. And Satan is the deceiver, the father of lies. I don't want to speak his language. I want to speak the truth. Speak the truth about Jesus. Speak the truth about correct living. Speak the truth that we find in his word. And not only do we speak the truth, but we live the truth. Verse 6. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprighteousness. He walked in uprighteousness. He lived it. He spoke the truth, and he lived the truth. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this below, live the truth. I want you to write consistent. 
consistent. He did what he spoke. He did it day in and day out. He was consistent. He was the same person here as he was out there, as he was at his job, as he was when he was grocery shopping. If they did grocery shopping the way we do grocery shopping, I'm sure it's a little different. But Levi was consistent. I, I, we put on a fake. We do. But living the truth. If we were to live the truth, if we were to live the way that we speak, we're talking good game. You think the world would respect us more and seek the truth from us? I think they would. But when we, when we, when we live a different life than we speak, we sin and we drag others down. Look at verse eight. Verse eight. But you have turned from the way, you've turned from the truth, and by your teaching have caused many to stumble and violated the covenant with Levi. They are setting up stumbling blocks and they are leading people to sin. That is not, that's not my heart's desire. My heart's desire to lead people to truth, not cause people to grow further and further in sin. But as I look at my life and I look at my example of living the truth, I have to agree with more rights. He writes, ministers cannot sin or suffer alone. They drag down others if they fall. When I sin, my family suffers. When I sin, this church suffers. Because I'm a leader. Same goes for you. When you sin, those around you suffer. So it's not about faking it. We've got to hide it better. It's about getting real and honest and repenting from our sin and through the power of the Holy Spirit, getting it out of our life. Bag it up and throw it away. Move on. Because sin is not an isolation thing. We can't sin and, and, and not get caught. It makes a difference in your heart and people notice that difference. And they see that, you're, that I'm fake. And we have to be authentic. We have to live the truth. We have to speak the truth and live the truth. Because we want people to respect us and hear the truth in it. Not because we're arrogant or boastful but because we want people to come to us and listen to the verse seven through eight through nine again. Let's read them again. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge. He ought to speak truth because we, he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty and people seek instruction from his mouth. That's what I desire. I want people to, to, to desire to hear the truth. But you've turned away from this and by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I've caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the people. Because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in matters of the law. I, I wonder if a preacher's words are highly esteemed and respected anymore. I wonder if a Christian's words, when they speak truth, are highly esteemed and respected anymore. I'm starting to think they're not. And one, it's maybe, it's, maybe it's on our shoulders. Maybe we have some blame to share here. You look at preacher scandals and moral failures time and time again, borrowing a little extra money from the plate. I hope you know when you, when you offer me a check and I refuse it like the plague, okay, that's just a good procedure. I don't want to touch money. I don't, I don't want ever to be accused of that. I want to live the most upright life as a minister as I can. So, so that, um, that people uh, respect us, that they want to hear the truth from our lives, that we don't let them down, that we don't lead the others into sin by causing when we suffer. And so I, I hope that people desire that. But it seems to be more and more that, that people are doing first, or Second Timothy chapter four. I'm gonna read that one real quick. You can write it down. I talk about this one a lot. It's a good verse. Second Timothy chapter four. Verse three through four. The time will come, 2 Timothy chapter four, verse three and four. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine, when they don't want to hear truth. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to miss. I think that, that, that was true then, in Malachi's day, that was true uh, when Paul wrote this, it's true today and it will continue to get worse. That people don't want to hear the truth. I pray that it's not because 
my life is fake. And I pray that I can do everything I can to build that respect among those, my peers, that they want to hear the truth, that they desire to hear the truth, that they don't surround themselves with people who are just saying what they want to hear. So go back to Malachi for the last thing that he does. The four things. Revering God, standing in awe of him, speaking true instructions, living this truth that we speak, and turning people from sin. Verse six. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. These priests were leading people into sin. But our calling, a true priest, a true minister's calling, a true Christian's calling is to turn people from sin. It's to realize that God hates sin. He's so mad at us, mad at sin, because he knows the damage it will do and the eternal separation it will cause. And so our desire, our calling, is to turn others from sin, to save them from it, to help them realize that sin is not truth. And if they live in it longer, they're rolling the dice. It's not worth a gamble. We have all been called to the ministry. We have all been called because we were made uh, through Christ. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Each and every one of us, a holy nation, God's special possession, a royal priesthood. That's what we're called to do. And so our response is to be faithful to the covenant, to stand it in reverence and awe of God's name, to speak the truth, the true instruction from our mouths, that nothing false will be found on our lips, to walk with God in peace and uprighteousness, and to turn others from sin. Let's pray. God, you, you gave us the reins. You looked at us and said, you are now the ambassadors. Each and every one of us in this room is a representative for you. That's a big task. But it's also a great opportunity for each and every one of us in this room to make a difference at our workplace, at our basketball team, and in our family. God, I pray that we can do that that we can speak your truth, live your truth, and bring the world to know who you are. In the Jesus Christ we pray, amen. If you've never said yes to Jesus, please say yes today and accept him as your Lord and Savior. Let's stand and sing our song of invitation.